my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Mike Akinfora. Today, I have a special treat. I have Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. Tom, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic here in the People's Republic of New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me just give it people... It is another world there, isn't it? It, it, it truly <laughs> is. It, it truly is. Let me give everybody who doesn't know Dr. Tom his bio. So Dr. Tom O'Brien is an internationally recognized speaker and workshop leader specializes in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and autoimmune disease diseases as they occur both inside and outside of the intestines. He is the co-founder of www.thedoctor.com. That's T-H-E-D-R.com. He is the visionary behind the paradigm shifting the Gluten Summit, a grain of truth, bringing together 29 of the world's experts on gluten connection to diseases, disorders, and a wide range of symptoms. You could Get that at www.theglutensummit.com. Dr. Tom, how are you? Hi, life is good. Wonderful, wonderful. So the first question that we ask our guests is, tell us about your journey. Share with my audience your journey into the realm of health and wellness. Aha. Well, let's see. Uh, when I was in my internship, uh, my ex and I could not get pregnant, and I decided to call the seven most famous doctors I'd ever heard of, holistic doctors, and ask them, what do you do? And they all told me some thoughts that they had. I put a program together, and we were pregnant in six weeks. <laughs> and my neighbors in married housing, um, of course, heard our joy and our happiness about this, and They'd been through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. And they said, will you work with us? And I said, well, you know, I don't, don't think it's going to hurt you. Sure, of course. They were pregnant in three months. And they'd been through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. And so I, so I came out into practice hot to trot, ready to help everyone get pregnant who wanted to get pregnant. And many times, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I mean, there, there's so many things that come into play in how, uh, in what contributes to that particular problem or, or all health problems, actually. But here's an example. Um, uh, when a couple mates and a man ejaculates, millions of sperm are swimming up the canal. Why is it that only one or two get through uh, that penetrate the egg? The sperm that hits the surface of the egg secretes an enzyme that enzyme digests a little bit of the mucus that's surrounding the egg to protect it, and it digests a little bit of the mucus, and it can swim right in. As it gets through and inside, um, it turns on some genes that shut down the mucus layer so no other sperm can digest and get through. That's really a beautiful system. Now, the enzyme that's secreted in the head of that sperm is completely zinc-dependent. So if guys have a zinc insufficiency or a zinc deficiency, they're fire and duds. Mm. And the only test that's done for men, the only test um, is sperm count and sperm motility. And um, so, you know, a guy gets a blood test done or, or a sperm test to see what's going on for them. And... Uh, 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 they're nervous as can be, and the test comes back, and everything's normal, and they walk kind of proud. You know, their chest comes up a little bit. Well, well, it must be you, honey. And then the woman gets shot all full of hormones when she doesn't have a hormone deficiency. But that's what they do. But in this case, this example, it was the man that had a zinc insufficiency causing the infertility. And we have found, um, I think it's three couples, maybe four I never treated the woman. I just treated the guy. Hmm. And by giving him some zinc, they got pregnant. Uh, so that's happened three or four times over the years. But that's an example of how comprehensive you have to be in how you look at this and what holistic health care is. And, but what I found for the women in those cases, as, as I came out into practice, I, I've helped a lot of cases of recurrent miscarriages and infertility and things like that. And, and uh, hormone imbalances, and there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but so far in my clinical practice, this is an every. 
every woman that had hormone imbalances or hormone irregularities also had some food sensitivities that they knew or did not know about that were causing inflammation contributing to the problem manifesting in their body infertility. Every one of those women had to be addressed for food sensitivities. That got me interested in the world of food sensitivities. And the most common food sensitivity, of course, is to gluten. So that got me into the world of gluten sensitivity. And the, you know, everybody, I, I shouldn't say everybody, but I want to have the largest impact I can in the world. Help as many people as I can and as comprehensively as I can. And the result is that um, uh, I've really looked at how can I have the biggest impact? How, how can I help the most people the most profoundly moving them in the direction of their health? And what I found consistently, the first place you start is with the foundation. And the foundation is stop eating foods you're sensitive to because you're throwing gasoline on the fire. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire. And when you do that, so many things start to calm down just as a result of getting those foods that may taste good and you don't get stomach pain when you eat them so you think they're okay. But if they're causing inflammation and you, the vulnerable area for you is your brain, you get migraines or attention deficit or seizures if you're a kid. Uh, it just depends on where the weak link is in your chain as to where the symptoms manifest from food sensitivities. The gut is not where they manifest. For every one person, that has gut symptoms with celiac disease, there are eight that do not. They have symptoms in their liver or their gallbladder or their brain or their heart or their muscles or their bones. So it's an eight to one ratio. So you think you're eating a food and you don't get pain so it's not a problem? Wrong screening tool to determine if it's a problem or not. And so we have found that time and time and time again. That's why my main message now is and has been for many years is just check to see if you have a sensitivity to gluten because it's a primary trigger in the development of autoimmune diseases, and perhaps we'll get into that. Sure, sure. And, you know, it's very interesting because uh, I want to really touch more on this gluten sensitivity, but guys will say, well, I can eat I can eat a, a sandwich with no problem, where, where I think I'm stereotyping, of course, but women have a, a more – sensitive nature and are more inquisitive when it comes to these things and they seek us out when it comes to these types of issues so could you dive in a little deeper dr tom and, and talk to us about back up a second and talk about gluten sensitivity and then talk about how it relates to the hormonal issues that you're seeing sure um first before i do that with what you just said about guys and 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 women, mm -hmm. um, guys are boneheads. <laughs> and, you, know, and, you know, my term for it usually, if I'm being polite, is, well, sir, you have an approach as if you're driving a Sherman tank. <laughs> and you just keep going and going and going. And that's the guy who gets diagnosed. He goes in for a physical, finds out he's got cancer, and when they open him up, it's all, it's all through his body. Mm -hmm. And it's been there for a long time, and you just didn't pay any attention to all the little symptoms that were popping up. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if you want to get smart about this, you will use modern technology just to check and see where's the weak link in your chain. You pull it a chain, it breaks the weakest link. You want to see, is there a link that's starting to break? Because I'm, I'm going to go into this for a minute for these boneheads out there, because there's so many of them, and they think they're fine. And I just had a guy here in town last week that dropped at 42 wow. of a massive coronary. You know, and he was loved by the community, really nice guy. He's just a bonehead, you know, so uh, I'm a little aggressive about this today because yep. it's kind of fresh for me. Sure. That uh, the, for now, if you'll just accept the, it could be the number three, it's accepted as the number three, but it could be the number one cause of getting sick and dying in the world, in the industrialized world. It's not heart disease. Heart disease is caused by your immune system attacking your blood vessels. And so it's an immune system that's gone haywire it would appear to be haywire. It's not when you look at the mechanisms, but it's an activated immune system that causes the atherosclerosis, hardening of your arteries, plugging up your pipes, 
that causes heart disease. It's your immune system. So number three cause of getting sick and dying has been known for many years is autoimmune diseases. But when you look at the mechanism that causes cardiovascular disease, it now becomes the number one mechanism in getting sick and dying is your immune system attacking self. And whether it manifests as cancer or heart disease or liver cancer or brain dysfunction, uh, it's the immune system. So if you're going to be smart about this, you just check to see, is my immune system overactive right now? Is my immune system attacking my thyroid? Or is my immune system attacking my brain? Or is my immune system attacking my joints? Because if you have elevated antibodies to brain tissue, I had three when I checked for the first time. If you have elevated antibodies to brain tissue, you're killing off your brain cells. Sure. But you can't feel it when you're killing off your brain cells. You don't feel it. And so you don't feel anything until there's so much damage now you start saying, oh, I must be getting old. I'm not remembering the way I used to. Ha ha. How old are you? Well, I'm 48. N no, <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. That there's inflammation killing off brain cells. That may be the mechanism of why you're not remembering. I mean, there's many reasons why you, your memory may be not what it should be. But in this example, it's the immune system attacking self. Sure. Or, um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more example, and then I'll go to your questions. Sure. A guy came in, 44-year-old guy, picture of health. His father died at 44 of a massive coronary. His two older brothers died in their early 40s of massive coronaries. This was the last male in the family. And, uh, and when his last older brother died, he was 27 or 28, he went to a cardiologist to put him on a statin to be protective. And so he'd been on a statin for a number of years at that point. He comes in. He has a 14% body fat, which means he doesn't have a lot of extra fat. He exercises regularly. He's, he's had a trainer for many years. He's focused on his exercise. He eats immaculately, never eats junk food, never. Um, picture of health, vibrant, dynamic guy, healthy lifestyle. Uh, all his doctors tell him he's healthy, uh, uh, lovely family. And he said, but I heard about your test, looking for the weak link in the chain. I said, okay, I want to do that test because it's a test of 24 different tissue antibodies and three of them are to the heart. So we did the test. All three antibodies to the heart were sky high. Hmm. Sky high. He said, but I feel fine. Of course you feel fine. That's because your muscles and your bones are really strong because you put a lot of time into exercising regularly and you do it smart. You don't deplete yourself. So you feel good. Your energy is good. But this, it's like saying, my car runs really good. Yes, but the the uh, uh, headlights, you know, are are worn out or something. You know, sure. a part a part of the car is not working right. And he said, "Well, why is this?" I said, "I don't know. Let's find out." Turned out he had elevated antibodies to many peptides of gluten, and he had something called pathogenic intestinal permeability. So we took him off of gluten. We took him off of dairy. We gave him the nutrients to heal his gut. Came back in six months, his heart antibodies were down to normal. Wow. No longer was he killing off his heart tissue. He said, you saved my life. And I said, well, you know, I'm, you know, probably this, this worked, it was, but it's not, you know, it's not me, it's my mentors. You know, and good for you for coming in, taking the initiative to come do this test. Because the test was five, was it five, 595, I think, or 600 bucks, something like that. Sure. His, and his insurance didn't pay for it. But this is life or death for him. And, you know, he thought he was the picture of health, but he was scared enough to check. And he found out he had the same problem, which with most likely, because his father and two older brothers had never been checked, most likely they had the same thing. Uh, and most likely it was genetic. Sure. Because autoimmune diseases, uh, there's a trilogy in the development of autoimmune diseases. You have to have the gene. There is an environmental trigger that sets it off, the straw that broke the camel's back. In this guy's case, gluten sensitivity and dairy sensitivity. And then you have to have something called intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. So that trilogy is in the development of autoimmune diseases. So that's an example of, you know, these guys that are Sherman tanks. And they say, I'm fine when I eat um, pizza or you know, I drink beer. I'm fine. Well, okay. Okay. We'll put that on your tombstone. You know, that you just want to check if you're not satisfied with your health or if you have some concern. You just check 
and you have to check thoroughly because most of the testing out there is not thorough. But you check thoroughly to see, do I have a sensitivity to this food or not? Sure. You know, here's a here's an interesting story. My wife and I and kids went out to Park City on vacation. You talk about environmental. It, we're, we're down at this shore right now. That's what, 6,000, 6,500, 7,500 feet elevated. And she had a gluten exposure and did not know it. We were up all night. She had arrhythmia. She had tachycardia. It was uh, frightening, yeah. frightening. Yeah. Because we've been we've been gluten free paleo uh, for over six years. So an exposure yeah. like that was frightening. And uh, by the time the morning came, she was okay. But it was absolutely a uh, a gluten exposure. Well, and, and it's possible that the weak link in her chain is her heart or her cardiovascular system. Sure. It's possible. And so one one trigger uh, one trigger put her over the edge. Yes. Which means it probably would be a good idea for her to do that same test Absolutely. to see if she has any elevated antibodies. I mean, that's why you have to think about this stuff because, you know, people drop. They're gone. You know, when they're gone, they're gone. And uh, and it's so unfortunate to see this happen so often, especially with um, younger people. Be and, you know, the world is getting sicker. Yes. Uh, and and I, I'm not just making that up. The World Health Organization rates the United States number two in overall quality of health out of 53 industrialized countries. Second from the bottom. Mm. We have the second worst quality of health care and results, second worst infant mortality rate second worst lifespan for women, and across the board, number two out of 53 industrialized countries. And for the first time in the history of the human species, for the first time ever, the New England Journal of Medicine published this seven years ago, our children born today have a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. They're going to die younger. They're going to get sick earlier get diagnosed with diseases earlier and die earlier than their parents. It's never happened before in the in in humanity. But and we all have our heads buried in the sand. On, just look at the statistics. And it's so overwhelming, people don't know what to do, but the first thing you have to do is wake up yep. and realize that you can't put your health in the hands of any type of health care insurance plan that dictates what you can do and what you can't do. And you have to reframe your ideas that you think it's okay to eat ding-dongs and ho-hos and drink Coca-Cola. Absolutely. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. Really? What kind of bozo thinking is that? Excuse me. But, you know, nobody talks to you this way. But you put a dime in a can of Coke. Leave it there 24 hours. Pour it out after 24 hours. The lines around the outside of the dime have been eaten away. It eats metal. What do you think it's doing in your body? Well, it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Excuse me. I, I think I'm on a roll this morning. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tom, what what is that test called, and where can they get that test? Yeah, yeah. The laboratory is called Cyrex Labs, C-Y-R-E-X. So you ask your doctor, CyrexLabs.com, mm -hmm. and the test is array number five, the multiple autoimmune Green or something like that. Excellent. I don't know the name of it. Excellent. And if, if, if your doctor won't do it, you can go to my website and you can get a lot of information and actually order the tests there. I'm not here to sell tests. Right. Go to your doctor. Get it done from your doctor. But you can get a lot of information on my site, thedr.com. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive into the, the hormonal part of this. So we know, we know gluten is terrible for us we know this this is this is what is there over eighteen thousand abstracts and research papers out there and growing every day right it's over twenty thousand now it's over twenty thousand so we know this but what effect does that have on our reproductive hormones well uh we know for example that the rate of celiac disease is two and a half to three and a half times greater in women with unexplained infertility than in women with normal fertility. That two and a half to three and a half times greater. And we know that women that have recurrent miscarriages, if they also have a sensitivity to gluten, 
when you put them on a gluten-free diet, eight out of nine of these women will have a healthy pregnancy and healthy delivery. Wow. Eight out of nine. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you read the statistics. I published a paper on this called uh, Celiac Disease and Reproductive Disorders, mm -hmm. and it's available for free. It's published in the Journal of Practical Gastroenterology. It's on my website. It's, it, um, you, you, can you can download it and read it. It's called Celiac Disease and Reproductive Disorders, and it's just remarkable to see the – I mean, you, it just drops your jaw. What? What? And I just quote the studies. This is not my idea, people. Yeah, I just, I'm a geek, and I read the studies. And when you read the studies, you say, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Eight out of nine women that have recurrent miscarriages who have a gluten sensitivity, when you check, they've got a gluten sensitivity. You put them on a gluten-free diet, they have a healthy baby. Wow. Yeah. Eight out of nine. Eight out of nine. I mean, are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Just read the studies. That that's scary. That's yeah. scary. So, and and what what my friend Rob Wolf, your friend Rob Wolf says, try try it for thirty days. Give it up. Try it and see what happens. See how it changes. And that's what right. I tell my patients. Tell right. they, I yeah. I completely agree with Rob on that. With a caveat. Yep. The problem is when they try it and they feel better, mm -hmm. whether it's their headaches or gut pain, or joint symptoms, or their skin's better. When they try it and they feel better, they say, oh, good, I'm going to do this. But then a couple months down the road, you're with your friends, you're at a party, you know, you you nothing to eat, you're hungry, you've had a beer, you had a glass of wine, or, so, or you, you, you had a beer. So you're getting gluten right there, yep. and you don't have a problem with it anymore, you think. So you, you feel fine. So every once in a while, you'll do it. And the problem with that, I'm going to tell you a study about the problem with that. Sure. There's a thing called the standard mortality ratio, the SMR. Mm -hmm. The standard mortality ratio in celiac disease is two to one. And what that means is that I'm 63. If I have celiac disease, and I do not, but if I did, and my brother is 62 and he did not have celiac disease, I am twice as likely to die at 63 of something than when my brother gets to be 63. I'm twice as likely to die at 20 than when my brother gets to be 20. I'm twice as likely to die at 90 than when my brother gets to be 90 of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, something. That's the SMR. How likely are you to die at a certain age? Well, if, if you're a celiac, it's two to one. With or without a gluten-free diet, it's two to one. And there's a whole reason for that, okay. which maybe we'll talk about later. They did a study of 1,043 celiac patients and 3,300 of their first-degree relatives, that's their parents and siblings, they followed them for over 20 years. Every year they got the blood test from their physicals. They, uh, they answered questionnaires about their health. How you doing? How's your body been feeling? How are you doing the diet? Are you meticulous on your diet? Do you cheat every once in a while? How you doing overall? And they followed them for over 20 years. And if you cheat, how do you cheat? What did they find? Those that were meticulous about following the gluten-free diet all the time, just as squeaky clean as they could be, their SMR was 0 0.5 to 1. Half as often, instead of twice as often, wow. were they dying earlier. They were living longer because they're really focusing on taking care of themselves. Those that were not as meticulous on following the gluten-free diet, defined as eating gluten once a month, well, this is what the researchers said. Death was most significantly affected by diagnostic delay, pattern of presentation, and adherence to the gluten-free diet. Non-adherence to the gluten-free diet, defined as eating gluten once a month, increased the relative risk of early death sixfold. Your SMR is six, six to one fold. if wow. you eat gluten once a month. That means you're going to get a disease. It's going to be killing you off your cells. You're going to start feeling lousy early in life, and you're going to die earlier in life if you have gluten once a month when you have a sensitivity. Now, some people can say, oh, he sounds like a nutcase. Just read the studies. Sure. I'm trying to tell you people that this is what the researchers are trying to tell us. And they're geeks. And, you know, they don't do it the way I do it. You know, to talk to you New Jersey people, you know, they got to kind of every once in a while. We just got to kind of get it in there. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Dr. Tom, stuff. you gave one of the best visuals of a gluten exposure that I've ever heard. Can you can you tell people about the mouse trap and the football field when we talk about gluten exposure? Oh, sure, sure. So it takes 976,000 mouse traps to fill up a football field laid side by side. 976,000. And I know the guy that figured this out. He wears pocket protectors for his pen. <laughs> He's one of those kind of guys. <laughs> so you lay down these mouse traps. You know, they're like the size of a cell phone. You lay them down side by side on a football field. You cock each mouse trap and put a ping pong ball on each mouse trap. Now you've got 976,000 mouse traps that are cocked with ping pong balls on them. If you look out on the football field, it looks white. All you can see is white, right? Mm -hmm. Walk along the sideline with one ping pong ball. Throw it out onto that big football field, a little ping pong ball. Throw it out there. It hits one mouse trap. Pop. Now there are two mouse, two ping pong balls in the air. The one you threw out there and the one in the mouse trap that just popped. They hit two mouse traps. Pop, pop. Now there's four ping pong balls in the air. Pop, 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 pop. Now there's eight. Pop, 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 pop. 16, and you have what's called a cascade reaction, and this thing has a life of its own. And the initial irritant that you first threw out there is long gone. That's what oxidative stress is. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you have an exposure to gluten and you have a gluten sensitivity. That's why your wife was up all night with arrhythmias and chest pains, and you guys were wondering, what do we do, what do we do? Mm -hmm. It's because pop, 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 pop took off at the weak link in her chain. Yep. And that initial irritant is long gone. That's why if you have one exposure, you will have elevated antibodies from anywhere to three to six months to your brain or your thyroid or your heart or your lungs or your liver, wherever your weak link is, from one exposure. That's why your SMR goes up to six to one with a once a month exposure. You never recover from the initial exposure again. Well, you know, it's very difficult to recover from the initial right. exposure. You may, but it takes some strong intervention. Sure, sure. I also noticed, and, and this was not uh, something we were planning on talking about, but haven't you come out with a product for those incidental exposures? That's exactly right. Yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah, and thanks for asking about that because I'm so proud of this. You know, sure. Talk I'm not to a, me. I'm not a product guy. Right. You know, I'm not a sales guy, so. But uh, this saves so many lives. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the uh, FDA published a paper earlier this year, three scientists from the FDA. Uh, uh, they looked at 286 different foods that are labeled gluten-free. And they looked at 180 foods that are naturally gluten-free, meaning you grab a box of rice pasta off the shelf, you read the label, it says rice, salt, and water. Uh, that's naturally gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And they did two tests on each of those products, almost 450 products, whatever the number was. They did two tests on every one of them to see, is there any toxic gluten in here? Those products that are labeled gluten-free, so it's got that little GF label on the outside of the package, 97.3% of them were gluten-free. Now, that's pretty good in the industry. That's uh, overall, as a regulated industry, that's pretty good. Now, if you're one of the 3% that got exposed, like your wife, yep. yeah, it's not very good. Correct. Right? Correct. But the foods that are naturally gluten-free, 24.7% of them had toxic levels of gluten. Wow. One out of four of those foods, whether it's oat bars or gluten-free cereal or uh, nuts and seeds or grains, one out of four of those had toxic levels of gluten. Here's an example. They did a study, published a study three years ago on 15 cultivars of quinoa, different strains of quinoa. Quinoa is a great grain. It's high in protein, it tastes good, it's a nice substitute for pasta. I mean, it's a great grain to use. Quinoa grows in Peru. No, it also grows in the U.S. No, it's never grown in the U.S. Yes, it <laughs> grows in the U.S. now. Well, how could it grow in the U.S.? It's, it comes from Peru. Well, there's a market for it, so they grow it in the U.S. Well, how do they get it to grow in the U.S. if it's a Peruvian product? They crossbred it with grasses. Oh. So when they crossbreed the quinoa grain from Peru with grasses from the plains of the Midwest, you have a new product. Yep. 
They still call it quinoa. But four out of the 15 cultivars in this study had toxic levels of gluten in them. So you never know. You're not safe. You're not safe to go out there and eat now because of the corporate, uh, the manufacturing world and going after this gluten-free market and the billions of dollars that are being made with um, some of these foods are really good and some of them are real junk. Mm -hmm. But you're not safe. And I've known this for a long time. And that's one of the main reasons why the SMR, standard mortality ratio for celiac disease, is two to one with or without a gluten-free diet, because they still get these exposures, and they get this inflammation, and they think they're gluten-free because they eat quinoa, but they're up with chest pains or they got uh, arrhythmias. Absolutely. Well, honey, I just ate quinoa. I don't know what's wrong here. And you don't know why, but you don't know the strain of quinoa you bought in the health food store actually was a strain grown in the Midwest, and it's got toxic levels of gluten in it, and you don't know that. Yes. And I've known, I've known this for years, and I just haven't known what to do about it. Sure. So I said, that's it, that's it. And I spent two years and finally met up with three scientists. And together, we came up with a product. The product is called GI Shield. And GI Shield will digest 99% of all gluten protein within 60 minutes. Also, dairy, soy, egg, peanuts, fish, tree nuts within 60 to 90 minutes, 99%. Now, the critical importance of this is that the sentries of your immune system that are standing guard to protect you from anything you eat that's not good for you, those sentries are called dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. They are just inside the beginning of the small intestine. So anything that comes out of the stomach that's not broken down or killed by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach that's a threat, the dendritic cells recognize it and activate an inflammatory response. That's just inside the beginning of the small intestine. That's why celiac disease is just inside the beginning of the small intestine. That's where it starts. That's why. And then you get this inf inflammation and it goes systemic. So all of the gluten digesting enzymes out there, some of them work, some of them work better than others, but they all take three hours, four hours to work, and the food comes out of the stomach within 90 minutes, 90 to two, 90 minutes to two hours. It comes out of the stomach into the small intestine. It's too late because mm -hmm. uh, these gluten digesting enzymes don't work for three hours. So this partially digested gluten comes into the first part of the small intestine. The dendritic cells recognize it. You activate the immune response. You get the inflammation through your body. If the weak link and you change your heart, you get arrhythmias. That's the mechanism of how this occurs. So we came up with the product. It's the only one on the market in human trials. It breaks down 99% of all gluten within 60 to 90 minutes. And it's called GI Shield. Brilliant. So anyone that has a gluten sensitivity should take one GI Shield before you start eating. Anytime you're eating grains or anytime you're eating out. Anytime. Because there's hidden sources. Let me tell you two sources. Sure. I took my sister to Jay Alexander's, a chain restaurant in the Midwest, and kind of an upper scale restaurant, nice food, you know, fifteen to twenty two dollars for a, for a piece of fish, that kind of a place. Mm -hmm. And she ordered a piece of wild caught salmon, grilled with a little olive oil and some sea salt. And I said to the waiter, "How's that served?" And he said, "Oh, it's served on a bed of rice with some vegetables." And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, please make sure to tell the chef everything needs to be gluten free. And that's exactly how I said it. I didn't say, oh, could you please tell the chef that everything needs to be gluten free, please? I didn't do it like that kind of namby pamby. Right. You've got to, you've got to look these people in the eye and be direct with them because, and he looked at me, yeah, yeah, right, sure. Like I just told you, it's fish, salt, olive oil, <laughs> rice, and vegetables, right? Yep. So he's thinking that and he gave me that look. But he came back and he said, I'm so sorry, sir, I didn't know. But chef puts a scoop of flour in all the rice when he cooks the rice in the morning. It makes the rice stickier. <laughs> so you don't know when you go. And three of the last seven Japanese restaurants that I've asked about, ask the chef if he puts flour in the sushi rice. Oh, no, no, no. You know, these nice Japanese waitresses. Oh, no, 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 we don't do this. I, I understand. Ask the chef, please. <laughs> 
And three of the seven came back. Oh, so sorry. Yes, yes, we put flour. I did not know we put flour in our sushi rice. Amazing. So you never know. Amazing. So you take GI Shield with you everywhere you go. and You just take one and it's going to protect you because, you know, and please excuse me for saying it like this. I really don't mean this personally. Sure. But I'm, I'm going to use it as the example. You don't know next time if your wife gets an exposure and she goes into arrhythmia, whether she's going to come out of it or not. Oh, absolutely. You don't know. Absolutely. You don't know. So I don't mean to be doing scare tactics, but this is life and death stuff. It, I and, agree. And it's cheap. It's cheap to do this. You just take one. That's all you need. And if you're eating a gluten-free pasta meal, you take another one in the middle of the meal. So you're digesting all this pasta in the middle of it in case there's any gluten in the middle of it. But it's designed for inadvertent exposures to gluten. One capsule is all you need with every meal. I love it. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. It's really appreciated. GI Shield. I'll put that in the show notes. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny because our favorite little restaurant in town, they have a menu and it tells you what's gluten free. And they had a special and uh, the same exact thing happened where the waiter said it's just steak and potatoes and a vegetable. And like, could you please, same thing, could you please check with the chef and make sure that exactly. there's no, and he came back and did the same exact thing, said, I am terribly sorry. He uses flour to crust on the, um, that, that, uh, that, uh, bake, uh, not bacon, the, uh, pepper, the pepper encrusted steak. He uses gluten. Like, oh, right. There we go. Right. Right. So they, they, they use flour on the pepper encrusted steak. Yep. And other chefs will put flour in the mashed potatoes. Yes. You just have to ask and you have to ask directly. You can't cannot be namby pamby about it. Exactly. So our time is running short, Dr. Tom. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our audience on this. Uh, where can they learn more about your work and what you're doing? Because it's fascinating. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. There's there's two places I'd recommend. The first is our website is thedr.com. Mm -hmm. Lots of interviews there, lots of articles that you can read. And if you really want a uh, uh, an OMG and a reality check about gluten, if you want information on it, um, I did a uh, interview process. I interviewed 29 of the world's leaders in this field of gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. The people in the world, the real leaders. I went to Oxford, England to interview the godfather of all celiac diagnosis. Uh, Bologna, Italy, the godfather of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Tel Aviv, Israel, the godfather of predictive autoimmunity. And I interviewed these world-class scientists. And I, and I interpret what they say in the middle of the, excuse me, professor, did you just say yes? Does that mean yes? Do you hear this, people? And so I try to interpret their geek language into everyday language for people so that you can really get what these researchers are trying to tell us. That's called the Gluten Summit, and it's at theglutensummit.com. And I'm not exaggerating. We've had over 18,000 emails of gratitude that have come in to say, thank you so much, you saved my life. Oh my gosh, I never knew this before. I feel so much better. I mean, just so many emails come in about the Gluten Summit. So for those listeners who really want to dial down on this to get the big picture overview, theglutensummit.com is the place where you get all of that information. You listen to the world's leaders from Harvard, from uh, well, uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain, the, the godfather of the whole paleo movement, the mm -hmm. guy that started all of this. I mean, you just hear all of these experts talk about it. So the two sites are the dr.com and the gluten summit.com. Absolutely. And, and I can vouch as I purchased it myself and learned more than I did in school from all of the experts that were on there. It was a wonderful, wonderful summit. Thank you. So, Tom, thanks again. It is always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, I hope to be out on the left coast someday soon and uh, hopefully run into you. Oh, thank you. That would be <laughs> wonderful. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. If you like what you hear and would like to pass it on to your friends, we greatly appreciate it. You could find us at iTunes Beyond Your Wildest Genes. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Ciao.